Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start this again because I didn't hit the record button. I did now. It's recording. Hi, I'm Ro Williams. <laughs> this is number five in the neurodivergent burnout series about writing. We're going to talk about it a little bit, and then we're going to write a writing guide together and see how that goes. I will be sharing my screen now. Um, and we will begin a PowerPoint slide situation. You did it wrong again. Let me switch. Talk. Okay. Now you see a big slide. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, yes. Okay. So this is writing with executive dysfunction. Uh, and if you don't already know, which I don't think it's possible because I think most of you found me on social media, my handle on social media is usually Fractal Echo. There are some places where it's different, but it's not important. Um, so the, this is, this is me. If you've never been here before, I'm not trying to be like, I'm this fancy person. I'm just trying to tell you what I do regularly as a human being. I, my research is in critical disability studies and science and technology studies as applied to human computer interaction design and engineering. Uh, what I really do is I study ethical reform and engineering research, education, and practice. What I really, really do is I study how to change the hearts of researchers. I, I study researchers, I research researchers and why they do the things they do. Um, I, If you're an academic, I write stuff. You can find it on Google Scholar, but the ones that I like the most, I guess, are my meta eugenics paper, the fractal paper, my paper about autism robots and how they're silly, and my paper about how all robots are disabled. I also offer mentoring. This is free, always free. I'm not doing this for fun and profit. I have a day job and I'm fine. Um, so mentoring, you can look up at Divergent Mentoring on tiny URL. And um, it says in there that it's for people who are researching technology, disability, and politics. Those are all extremely broadly construed. So if there's some reason that you feel like you want to talk to me, then that's enough. Um, libraries are technology, schools are technology, rocks are technology, so it's fine. Um, and um, so some basics we're going to start out with. I'm not doing the full lecture on executive function and metacognition. Um, those are in other videos, but we'll just start with some terms to help orient us, I guess. So executive functions are, for the purposes of this conversation, the cognitive processes that manage goal-oriented action, planning, task initiation, task switching, updating, like working memory updating, and adjusting to disruptions. So all things that are in, intimately tied with the process of writing. Uh, metacognition, or metacognitive strategies are the explicit tools that you use to work with your brain meat. Uh, so if you have executive dysfunction, metacognition is meant to, uh, metacognitive strategies can help you deal with those things. Um, I'm just gonna go through and- I'm to go through and mute people that happen to be unmuted on accident. Okay. And then finally, Lots of things count as metacognition, including bad things like hate yourself. <laughs> so I teach metacognition uh, led by tenderness, love, and compassion, or at least I try. Uh, so what this is, this event is, it's an example, a process, a scaffold. It's a celebration of neurodivergent writing. This is a way to get the scribbly thoughts out of your brain and onto a page. This is not the neurodivergent writing guide. This is a possible tool, okay? One of many potential things that may work for some of you, okay? Uh, what this is not, I am not gonna be talking about, first of all, <laughs> I'm not the professor is in and I don't like her. Uh, this is not how to satisfy neuronormative demands. This is not about how to write for everybody, for the people that tell you that you don't write good. This is not for them. 
This is not how to write like everybody else. It's not how to write for a particular audience. You know, I have a lot of thoughts about the idea of writing for an audience. Uh, eventually a chapter about it will be published. This is not about how to avoid critique, how to write in a way that makes you not, that prevents rejection. This is not how to write perfect for definitions of perfect that include systems of domination. This is just how to make the words go. Okay. Um, I looked at the sub, like the registrations and I looked through people's comments and tried to get a sense overall of the concerns. Um, my hope is that we'll have time for back and forth and Q&A today, but it might not be as in depth as pre or, prior sessions because this is more about like a specific process that we're trying to write together. But your concerns were things like how to even how to even do thing like how like wh what do you do about the blank page how do you even initiate the task of writing um things about pacing there was a lot of concerns about consistency or like how do you prevent yourself from doing that thing where you binge write versus maybe having a dedicated time for writing every day and a habit um i there are ways to, there are suggestions for how to like write more regularly, but I'm not always convinced that our problem is that we binge write and that we have to stop doing that. I think it becomes a problem because society is not set up for people to be, have these bursts of productivity and then these long periods of <laughs> convalescence. Um, so, but we can talk about different, ways to try to be more regular, but I don't want anybody to feel like they're failing if they can't achieve a regular kind of pace. I don't have a regular kind of pace. Um, another uh, thing people were concerned about was managing distractions. Um, we also had a lot of <laughs> how to write without the existential crisis which is what I mean, how to write without the crushing pressure of an eminent deadline or the fear of failure or like basically not being able to do anything until it's so emergent that if you don't do it, you feel like you're going to die. Um, and then also uh, things about communication within the writing. There was a lot of people asking about how to write concisely, uh, how to write structured. And we'll talk about how to communicate effectively, but it's not always going to be fitting into those norms of ideas about conciseness and structure. There's a lot of like normative insistence on a linear structure to writing, and I think it's unfair uh, that we get told that our hyperconnectivity is wrong and is the wrong way to express ideas. Um, and then even almost how to stop writing or, or how to or how to move on from a particular section of the writing. Um, I, there were some comments about getting stuck in the details or about like getting trapped in the background literature, feeling like you couldn't move on because you hadn't read everything. Um, and then how to edit and revise when you would rather die. Um, we'll talk about that also. Um, so we will, when we begin writing the guide, we'll have a section that deals with some of these primary concerns and then we can write about them. And that's where a lot of you can provide your own ideas and feedback. I'm gonna check the chat. How to write with existential crisis. Yeah, yeah, how to write when the world is going to shit. Yep. Uh, um, I can send the slides out also. Yes, that's been asked. <laughs> um, and so next slide, maybe. All right. So here's our list of tools that I used. I'm not going to be using them today because we're trying to everything. I want you to be able to see everything that I do. And I don't currently have. Okay, the camera's going to move. So if that's gonna make you wanna throw up, close your eyes and I'll tell you when it stops.
I'm not going to show you my galaxy brain Charlie from Always Sunny uh, nightmare shitstorm of places where I try to put writing together um, because I don't have a good camera set up for that. So we're going to try to do it in a digital space as much as possible. I'm going to stop um, looking for anyone who closed their eyes. Oh, yes, I stopped. Thank you. All right. Um, so things that I use, big pieces of paper. Um, and so a lot of times people would use a whiteboard, which is fine, or a chalkboard. I've been using giant pieces of paper because I can keep them. <laughs> so that's been neat. Uh, sticky notes and uh, digital versions of those are Trello or even PowerPoint. Um, and that's just like a way to jot down ideas and like move them around until you find a flow that you like. I use a lot of different colors. I've got several different colored markers. I do scribbles, uh, small diagrams or lots of arrows, uh, or even like a storyboard because I happen to be able to draw a little bit. Um, I also mentally use something I'm calling radical non-committance, which is that like, it's okay to delete stuff. It's okay to erase. It's okay to throw away that paper. It's okay to start over. It's okay to, it's also okay to have something that's not perfect. So when you're trying to get away from the blank page, one of the problems is that you think everything that you write down has to be correct. Um, it doesn't, you can fix it later. So just start vomiting words and then deal with if they're good or not. Um, another tool that I use and wish that I used more is companions, which we will talk about, I think on the next slide, yes. And then text to speech is something else that I use uh, particularly for editing. There were comments about like, how do you edit um, when you like are missing, like <laughs> you have dyslexia and you literally can't see what's wrong. Uh, I have the computer read to me uh, and that helps me catch stuff that I can't see with my eyeballs. Um, and now, so what did I mean by companions? This is not just about having co-authors. This is not just about having people that you trust to provide you with feedback. This is not just about having people who you trust to edit your work. Talking with other people, exploring ideas with other people, and just sitting in the same space or the same digital space and writing at the same time or other forms of like parallel play is companionship in writing. Um, we have to talk about how we're not gonna talk about AI. I have thought about doing a thing about AI, but I just can't even get past the part where I create a bunch of examples because I keep thinking about all the gallons of water it takes to literally ask ChatGPT a question. So I don't use it, but I don't condemn using it either because I know that there are people, for example, my international students use it because if it can improve their grammar, then they get treated less badly by other teachers who judge them poorly for idi idiosyncrasies as English is their second language. I also know autistic people that are using it to have conversations with themselves. So they're not really asking ChatGPT to tell them what to do. They're using ChatGPT as like a, a sounding board. So they'll put a bunch of information in it and then ChatGPT will tell them what it thinks that they said and then they'll correct it. And they'll have this conversation with themselves until they actually feel like they can communicate what they need to other people. And I, I can't sit here and be like, you should new to ChatGPT because I've actually seen this process helping somebody in a way that I, they just can't get that help from anybody else right now. Sam Altman is a piece of shit and so are all his friends. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't like the entire big data infrastructure that we have. And I think that it is the reason why we can't have nice things like a conversational AI that maybe actually would be useful, helpful and not murdering things. Uh, and if you're able to use companionship in the ways that I've described and will describe more later, then you're not going to need it. Okay. But again, we're just not talking about it today because I'm, I don't use it. So I can't tell you how to use it. Um, I'll just check in the chat. Okay. 
So what counts as writing? Thinking is writing. Remembering is writing. Dreaming is writing. Talking is writing. Drawing is writing. Pre-writing, which is something I've just recently started to see people say, like as, as a thing. And that means all the stuff you do before you being in writing, obviously. That's writing. Rewriting is writing. Reading is writing. Editing is writing. One way that I think about this is as a computer scientist, somebody who programs, we talk about data streams as being either readable or writable. Um, even reading though, rewrites bits. So anything that changes a thought in your brain, a thought in somebody else's brain is writing, okay? Um, and I don't mean like changing somebody's mind. I mean like just putting the thought there in the first place. So I am gonna talk about something called a fractal scaffold today. Now I want to be very clear that this is not a rule, but when you're sitting there and you're thinking, I have no idea how to write the thing that I need to write, or I have no idea how to even get this point across, this tool can help you get it onto paper and then decide which rules you wanna break and how you wanna tear it up and do it a different way, okay? So, um, the steps are premise, context, substantiate, acknowledge, reaffirm, point the way. And we'll go through, there'll be more detailed slides in just a second that tell me what each of these steps are. But first I wanna explain why am I calling it a fractal scaffold? Because this is in general, a structure that you can use at the level of the entire document, at the level of the section, at the level of a paragraph, at the level of an abstract, a summary. This can be used at any point, at any layer or level or register within a text, okay? Um, checking the chat again. Okay. Um, so, Uh, what do I mean by premise? I mean, what's your main point? I mean, literally, what's the core of you want to of what you want to say? If you wanted somebody to remember one thing, what would it be? Uh, this is often like in a in an academic work, like your central thesis or whatever. Um, the next one is context. Wait a minute, I'm sorry, I need to check, okay. Context, that's prior work or historical context, background, examples, what people before you have said or written about. Um, in fiction writing, it would be like reminding the reader about things that happened in the past or about world building. Um, and I realized while doing this that I'm gonna have to do a completely separate one of these on literature reviews or academics, because I have to teach my graduate students how to do literature reviews every time I teach a class because nobody else is doing it. And I just, I wish that we introduced our students to librarians more than we do. And anyway, yes, I'm going to have to, it's a whole other talk though, how to do a literature review and I just can't fit it in here. Okay. Um, and then the other parts, substantiate, acknowledge, reaffirm. So you, you corroborate that premise um, with an illustration or an explanation. Um, you explain the method of inquiry, analysis, and argument. You explain how the background ties to the premise. You acknowledge. So when there is um, complications, nuances, limitations, counter arguments, conflicts, controversies, you have to say so-and-so says this. And that would undermine everything that I'm trying to say. So here's how I'm dealing with that. Okay. Um, and then you reaffirm. So you justify why you're continuing despite the counter arguments and you restate your premise. Okay. Um, and then pointing the way. A lot of people talk about this as like transition or leading to the next thing. 
but I want to leave room for neurodivergent ways of thinking and writing and explaining and that it may not be linear and that you might refer back. Um, you might sign point backwards or to the left or something. And um, and so that's that's something that I will be talking about too. Um, quickly, I'm gonna come back here to this. I said it was a fractal structure because you could do this at the paragraph level, the section level, the document level. And so I wanted to, for the academics in the room that are used to having to write in a particular structure, you could think of the premise as the introduction, um, the context as the background, um, the substantiation as the methods, methodology, um, acknowledgement, uh, Again, acknowledgement may happen within the premise and the context. It would also happen in the, here is the data, <laughs> right? Um, and then reaffirming is like the discussion. So like explaining how that data says something about what your premise was meant to say and then pointing the way would be like the conclusion. So that's an illustration of how I'm intending this to be a fractal scaffold. Um, I'm gonna check chat again. Yes, writing backwards is allowed. Okay. All right, and so now we're gonna do it together. Um, I turned, oh, there it is. Okay, so um, we're gonna try it together. I made a Google Doc so that we could all be in the document together. Um, and so it's at tinyurl.com slash ndwritingguide all there's no like underscores or spaces or or caps but the font put it in all caps sorry <laughs> um i'll put the link in the chat also um so here's the link in the chat okay um, so I'm going to come back to the scaffold. I'm going to, you can see both of these, right? You can see the slides and the Google sheet. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to keep this here to remind me, and I want to show you something that I use. Um, so no matter what text editor that you're using, whether it's Word or Libre or Google um, or some other kind of like markup thing like Sublime Text or something, you have headings and other kinds of um, formats available to you. So like we have like normal text, oops, that's not doing anything. normal text, right? And that's just words, but what you can do um, is you can also specify titles and headings. And the reason why this is useful, I mean, there's lots of reasons why it's useful, but I'm about to show you why it's useful in the process of writing, okay? So we're gonna call this title A. Well, those aren't, those aren't the right letters. And we are gonna struggle a little bit because while I am typing, I may not be able to speak. Um, and I'm not going to be writing complete sentences. I'm going to do that refinement later so that we can actually like, otherwise you're just going to be sitting here listening to me go clack, clack, clack. And that's not what I meant to do. Um, and so that's the title. Well, we're going to do a heading one and we're going to call it premise. And we're going to do heading one again, and we're going to call it context. We might rename these, but I'm setting up the structure of the document again. Um, and adding one substantiate. And acknowledge. And point. All right, 
so why did I do this first? I want to show you something over here, which I know this works in words. If it doesn't work in here, I'm going to scream. <laughs> you can move these around in Word. You can drag and drop them. Uh, and that means that you can reorder, reorder your entire document without having to try very hard. So um, it doesn't look like they let you do that in Google yet, uh, so, but I'm gonna keep it in Google for this. I want you to know though, that it can be really helpful. If you continue to use the heading structures that are available to you, it's easier to swap the document around um, without losing pieces or getting confused, okay? Um, and so it's really fun in Word because you can just like move all of these around and they automatically, anything underneath them moves with it and it's very cute and fun. Um, I may show this, but I'm gonna come back to. And and I am pretty sure that if it does this in Word, then it's gonna do this in Libra or Open Office too. Um, and so you can see, I can move these around and they just move. And like anything that was underneath it, like anything that's underneath it's gonna move too, okay? So that can be a fun way to deal with your documents. What's really nice about it is when you get into subheadings. So if you were using like, uh, If you are using subheadings and you decided actually it makes more sense like this and you start reordering it, you can do that. Um, and so that's just, especially when you're at the level of just writing notes or like an outline, it can be really useful to just be able to drag stuff around like that. Um, but we're gonna do this in Google Docs and if we need to do that, we will just use cut and paste like it's 1997. Um, Okay, so I said that we might rename these sections and I think that we will right now. Um, if we were to be thinking of, okay, we're trying to write a writing guide based on neurodivergent ways of writing and we're using this scaffold to help us begin writing. But um, the titles of these sections are just based on the scaffold and they don't really make sense for a writing guide. So um, uh, the premise about that uh, is something like, um, like writing is hard for virtue people. Mostly hard because our Okay, I don't think that that's gonna be the words that are actually in the final document, but I wrote those for myself, okay? Um, and so the, the context here would be things like, what makes writing hard? Uh, what, what makes writing education fail neurodivergent students, writers. Um, <clears throat> instructions. Substantiate. Um, when, when we wanna substantiate um, this guide, I wanna talk about um, talk about the webinars, talk about how we wrote this document, um, talk about why document like this might help others, okay? So you can see, this is obviously not what the document's gonna say when it's done. I am writing instructions to myself. Um, and so uh, 
if one of the problems that we face in writing is executive function, then providing a set of directions is a scaffold that can help get through that. When you're thinking, I don't know what to do next, you can literally write to yourself what to do next, um, and that can help. Now, I, I'm sure that somebody's going to bring up being pathologically demand avoidant and that writing a demand for yourself may not be effective if you feel like every time somebody makes a demand that you want to pull your eyeballs out of your face. Um, so I understand that. And that is actually an acknowledgement. And I want to put in the various concerns that people had mentioned. And um, and in in those concerns, we will address solutions to concerns. Um, so we're starting. There are words on the page now everyone. So there's a few things that I did here. First, I started with a blank page, which is difficult. And I used the scaffold to make the page not blank anymore, even if it doesn't look anything like this in the end. Um, and I, um, when I wrote down things, it's mostly notes or reminders to myself or even actions that I should take next. Um, and so we can, and another thing that I did was I didn't take my meds. And I didn't take my meds for lots of reasons. One, I haven't been taking them because of reasons. And I thought to myself, I could remember to take them today, but I won't because it would be nice if y'all could see somebody trying to go through this without meds, which do help actually. Anyway, I'm not on my meds. What's my chat say? Invitations. Yes. Invitations. Wonderful. So, and if you are dealing with um, uh, like if talk about the webinars is too demanding, right? You could even write questions to yourself. Could you? Tell us about the weather or what do you want to say like phrasing them in ways that make you feel less threatened is also fine uh okay and and the the person who mentioned invitations was dale ireland and they say they like the idea of questions so that's fun um okay so I don't, somebody was, it's fine, this is going to happen. Somebody was writing and then moved something. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so we can start filling out this document just based on the resources that we have available to us. Okay. So like an example would be that we have a slide on here with people's concerns. Um, and so we can put them in in the acknowledgements and we can put them in this, like what are the various concerns? And we can just copy and paste the slide content <laughs> here. It will be white, which is not helpful, but I can do this. Uh, that was, if you highlight something and hit control spacebar and word, it will default to normal text, by the way. So that's nice. Now I didn't keep the structure of these, but I'm not worried about that right this second. I'm gonna work on. Oops, that's not it. Okay. So now we have the concerns that we wanna talk about, right? And so now I feel that we can start to rename this section too. And we can maybe call it common struggles for neurodivergent writers, okay?
And so this would be a subheading. We probably won't call it how make fingers go word, but maybe we will. Uh, and then this was a subheading. And this was a subheading. And this was a subheading. And this is a subheading. This is a subheading. Okay, so our subheadings now for what are the common struggles are based on the things that you submitted in the registration forms. Uh, and so how to begin pacing, managing distractions, communication, um, how to write with and without the existential crisis. Um, and how to communicate and uh, how to transition and how to edit, okay? So these are, um, these are our subheadings for basically the core of our paper at this point, which is like, what are the struggles and how are we gonna deal with them, okay? Um, in fact, we may even just go ahead and call this common struggles for neurodivergent writers and what? to do about it, I don't know. Um, and so here is where I invite people to begin writing. For example, if you have other things that didn't come up that you wanna, that you want us to address, or if you have ideas about what you do to manage those things, then we can begin making notes about that. And so I will make notes in the managing distractions section about how sometimes I use music for that. Uh, sometimes I use music for that, but sometimes different music can be more distracting. Um, sometimes I uh let the I let the procrastination cleaning happen. So the thing where you're like, I have to write. Instead, I will clean my refrigerator. Just go ahead and let it happen. Uh because it might make you feel better. Uh, some of that compulsion to clean before doing something that you find really difficult is actually something that you need. It's not just avoidance. Like sometimes you can't write if your desk is covered in shit. So I'm not going to sit here and be like, convince yourself that you don't need to do that and only write because who wants to write at a desk covered in Mountain Dew cans or something? I mean, maybe some of you, that's fine. Uh, it's okay. Let the procrastination cleaning happen or otherwise understand why it's happening and decide whether or not you want it to happen, okay? Um, I'm gonna move this because it's not helping. Wow, that made everything weird. Whoa. No, it's still weird. That makes me mad. I'm just gonna ignore it. I don't know what's up with the margin. I think it's probably just on my screen, hopefully. Uh, it annoys me. <laughs> I hate it so much. Wait, is it really not? Oh, okay, somebody else is gonna fix it. I can see everything is highlighted. Okay, no? Okay, we're gonna fix this together. Oh, somebody, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible when everybody tries to edit the document at the same time, but I did that on purpose so that we could do this together. That's fine. We can always, we can fix that later. Okay. Um, I 
so yeah, so this is the part of the document that's important. And um, how to write without existential crisis, I will put some things in here. So, whoops, that's not it. Um, Um, so some of the ways that I deal with trying to write without the pressure is that I establish my own goals for pre for like intrinsic motivation and pressure. So if there's no deadline, for example, you're submitting something to a journal, so there's no deadline really well, how do you make yourself write that paper if you know it's going to a place that doesn't really care when it shows up? Um, you have to come up with a different deadline besides the one that the journal would give you. You have to decide, I would like to get this submitted by X date because that allows me to do X, Y, Z. And so then it becomes an accountability for yourself and not to somebody else. But that also means that you can update that and choose and like be flexible and say, you know, I wanted this done by May, but now we're closer to May and I realize that it's not really realistic and I can move it to June because I've decided to reprioritize things, right? And it's true. Sometimes I get myself into this phase where there's something that I really guess I just either don't want to write or I feel like it's not going to be good or for some other reason, I'm not confident in it and I just keep moving it and moving it in the calendar, um, I find that when I've done that, I haven't made it small enough, I haven't broken it down enough, and I haven't made it meaningful enough to me. I haven't made it something that feels like I can do it and that I need to do it. So um, I will uh, try to write that somewhere. Where'd that go? Uh, I think those are not the words I used. That's fine. Um, I can go in the transcript and find out what I said I said. Hey. Uh, So how to write with existential crisis. One thing that I want to add is like how to write, what if, how do you, what if what you're writing about just feels super unimportant in the wake of things that are happening. Um, this one is really hard. And it's also like, it's okay to take a minute and be like, this is just not important to me right now because I don't know if there's gonna be a world in a week. Um, but but um, you can, you can give yourself the space to be unimportant. <laughs> for a minute uh and then you can think about ways that these things are still important even within the context of this i will give a example when the pandemic was brand new uh it was like why the fuck am i gonna write about this right now um literally who cares like i'm like trying to do a dissertation involved involving like technology and executive function and i'm like who cares people are dying um well it turns out that more people than ever struggle with executive dysfunction because covid made their brain soupy so what i was doing was important in a way and what i continue to do matters 
specifically because we failed to do anything meaningful about the pandemic. Um, there are other examples. Um, so for example, how do you do a neurodivergent writing guide webinar when there's a genocide happening? Well, first of all, there's multiple genocides happening. We just happen to be paying attention to this one. It is also like significantly more escalating. It's real bad. Uh, well, if you notice, there's a lot that goes on when people try to testify as to what's happening to them and people dismiss that testify, that, that testimony. And it has to do with what we have decided constitutes like authentic testimony. Who gets to be, who gets to tell the truth? And so in some very small and significant way, giving people a space to explore neurodivergent ways of writing gives people spaces to explore non-normative ways of reading and non-normative kinds of legitimacy. So uh, having a space to explore the idea that there's not some correct way to write about the reality that you're living through. I think that it matters that we all practice that. So when I said at the beginning of this, that this is not a workshop about how to write for the norm, this is also a workshop about how to liberate yourself from only being able to process what you read as though it's coming from a normative lens. I don't really think I did the words that good there, but I tried. Anyway, how to that's a how to write with executive with ex existential crisis. Um, um, try to with. So I wrote, try to, with humility and grace, I mean, don't be megalomaniac about it, connect your work to the global struggle for liberation, okay? Um, so let's take a look at this messy, messy thing. How to make the fingers go word purposely bad. Bonus points if it makes you laugh. Mind mapping. Come to the page, a couple of questions. Write what comes out of my mouth and change that until it feels like something that would be written and maybe more fun. Yeah. So when I had mentioned before about using companions and talking, um, to some extent I meant that, but we have tools now. You could literally open up a Zoom and have a conversation with a friend and use the transcript to help you write. I just, somebody's face is like, they're losing their mind over this. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so like that's that's a thing that we have available to us and it doesn't just have to be Zoom or whatever. Um, uh, there is a dictation software in Word and on Mac OS. And so like you can look at di dictation software or find free stuff or wh whatever or stuff that you already have access to and use that kind of transcript, right? Um, and so let's say you don't really have anybody with you that you can talk to. You could talk to your cat or your dog. If you've been in these sessions for a while, you know about putting googly eyes on a house plant. You can give yourself somebody to talk to if it's 3 a.m. and you don't want to bother anybody. I don't know if it'll work, but you could try it and nobody will laugh at you because nobody's awake. 
<laughs> so it's fine. Um, so we are about like, we have like eight minutes left. And um, I knew that this would potentially go over. Now I'm actually gonna finish this document and release it. Okay, so, but, um, but in the meantime, and, and y'all can keep writing in it also. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, some of this stuff, like the context um, will actually involve some research literature, which will be fun. Uh, and so I guess I wanna open it up to, uh, and we don't have to end right at noon, but I just wanna open it up to people who want to ask further questions or add more things. And, you know, obviously y'all have been adding stuff into the document and I, <laughs> I'm not the police, you're adding whatever you want. And, um, I see a lot of chatter, but I, I missed a lot. Like there was like 20. So I'm gonna try to see what's going on. But anyway, you can freely unmute and talk to me. Can I ask if there's anyone here who actually teaches writing or has taught writing or I'm just curious because this seems like such a great connection to the work I do as a teacher of writing who struggles with her own writing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't really, I teach like design and ethics. Um, and I know Andrew was in here and Andrew teaches like musicology, but that involves writing. Uh, mm -hmm. I know I have a lot of friends who teach rhetoric and comp, but I don't know if they're here. Um, my yeah, favorite rhetoric and comp teacher, um, is is Cynthia Dealey is um uh, this is Leah. Hi. I taught, I taught writing to in in public school, like not specifically usually, well in primary, but like that's early elementary, but also um to neurodivergent students like K to twelve, um as and um, I think one of the issues was for some of my students, the idea of the outline, because it seemed to me that um, they would come with the whole idea in their head, like when they were able to write. I remember one student specifically, when they were able to actually go, yeah, okay, I could write about that. They actually, I think, had the whole thing in their head. And I feel like that sometimes too. Maybe I don't have the whole thing, but I can't break it down into that idea of um, make an outline. It sort of breaks apart. It broke apart what this student already had whole. It was like, okay, now you must break this apart. And they knew mm -hmm. where they were going. And for me, I find that sometimes I don't know where I'm going, but I have a more kind of holistic kind of, or I don't know what the word is, but a more an approach where it just kind of comes and then I work with it. It's like clay, not, not an outline. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I definitely wouldn't, if somebody feels like they can open up the document and just begin vomiting into it, then I'm certainly not going to tell them to make me an outline. Right. Right. Um, I also have worked with middle school students that struggle with written expression and mm -hmm. I've gotten it put into their IEPs, for example, that they can submit an oral assignment or or that as part of their writing, they can draw a comic. Yeah. And then go from there. So um uh, and that, like, sometimes they just can't express it in text words. And and another thing that um I've done is use like PowerPoint kind of as a container to hold together a whole bunch of small things like a poem and a video and this and that that represent the whole of the learning and so it was like a great way to pour a bunch of things in a jar 
Yeah, I actually, I really want to put that in here somewhere. Um, is that PowerPoint or like practicing trying to present the idea to somebody else is can help you structure a document. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, yeah. that doesn't have to be some sort of perfect linear, like neuronormative way of structuring the document. But if you can think of, okay, inside of our brains, it's a non-Euclidean space, but outside of our brains, things happen in a time line. And so when we start talking, that's linear in a way. And so like how, what would we say if we were saying it, right? Um, and and we can we can refer back and we can foreshadow and all of that. So it's not really linear, but like there's always this idea of like I have thing in brain and it's a non-Euclidean shape. And what I mean by that is it's not like a perfect X Y Z axis 3D shape. It's got special math. And and um and so but like when we get into meat space, there is some sort of order that has to happen in order for something to actually be expressed. Um. And that practicing that can help make it happen. Um, and in particular, I like having this practice with friends because when they're like, wait, I don't understand, they can stop you and say, I'm missing something. And you can figure out what that is and where you need to put it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I still get lots of reviewer comments about how the structure of my work doesn't make sense and all of that. And sometimes they're right. And sometimes they just want it to look regimented and I will fight them as long as I can. Uh, and an example of a piece that went through almost three years of fighting and came out in a, in a way simultaneously more and less structured than I initially meant for it to be is the fractal piece that I mentioned earlier. And so I'll, I'll share it with you. It's very galaxy brain, you guys. I don't expect anybody to read it, but I just want you to see an example of a paper that made it into a journal that was constantly critiqued for having no structure. Oops, that downloaded the whole thing. I didn't want that. I wanted this one. Okay, here it is. Yes. All right. So um, again, uh, you can keep writing in the document if you want. I will probably let it settle down. Uh, and then I will begin writing it and like cleaning it up and making it an actual resource. Uh, those are my emails. Don't look at those. Uh, and um, and this video recording will be released. Uh, you'll all get the link as soon as Zoom processes it. And then as far as like the, the YouTube version will come out in the next few days. And um, yeah, so I'll stay on for a little bit uh, if anybody has anything that they want to talk about. But I'm going to stop the recording now because people tend to, to not want to watch more than an hour of faces. Okay. Um, all right. Um, how do, where's, I need to stop it. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,